please welcome to the stage, Angie MacArthur. Good morning. Two things have struck me about Traverse City since arriving here. One is the unbelievable commitment this community has to your community here at large and also to the global community. So I feel like Traverse City is a model for the rest of the world. It's a real honor to be here and an honor to follow Priscilla. The most significant gift our species brings to the world is our capacity to think. The most significant danger our species brings to the world is our inability to think with those who think differently. This is the quest I have been on as an author, a consultant, an athlete, an artist, but mostly as a thinking partner to others. The dangerous consequences of not being able to think with those who think differently came to me as a shock at the age of seven and why this question became implanted as my internal compass. 1975, I arrive in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia as an expat child. Every smell, the vast desert landscape, the spoken word was different. There was nothing familiar. I had just learned how to read, but I could not read here. We lived in a walled compound of 300, with 300 other expats from 37 different countries. So there was not one way to be normal. To help me navigate all these differences I was experiencing at such a young age, I developed three best friends. Wonder, inquiry, and discovery. My young mind had a very simple process to help me navigate the incredibly social complex world around me. I would see something unfamiliar, this would spark curiosity, and I would ask question after question after question until I could get to a place of understanding. Strangers were supposed to be dangerous. Those who were different were supposed to be dangerous. So I thought if I understood why they did things the way they did, they wouldn't be so dangerous. I remember walking in the souks, the markets with my mother. I was young. And there was an old man carrying a long stick, and he seemed very dangerous, very scary to me. But curiosity got the better part of me, and I went up and asked him, why do you have a long beard and carry a stick? And he laughed, and he pointed to a pickup truck full of camels and said, I'm a camel herder. This scary person suddenly transformed to the most magical man who got to ride camels and live in tents in the desert. Questions connect us. Human to human, seven-year-old to old man. It's such a shame we lose this very authentic way with connecting with others. I also had to learn the other side of this great lesson. What is it like when people are afraid of your differences? At age 13, I took my very independent self off to Canadian boarding school. I left a land of foreigners where I felt completely at home and arrived in my home country where I've never felt more like a foreigner. My parents very kindly bought me the same clothes so I could look like them, but I could not begin to think like them. I had grown up without mainstream TV, movie theaters, shopping malls, rock bands, so there was nothing about me that made me cool. Nothing. And my differences were understood. The harder I tried, the more isolated, and rejected, I felt. Little did I know, I was being given a gift that would last me a lifetime. 
The gift was that being awkward and confused by people is okay. I wasn't going to die. But more importantly, I didn't need to hate them. That if I remembered my old friends of curiosity and wonder, eventually I could discover a way to connect with those people. I took my confusion to my journals to get it out of my head. It's much less evil when it's on paper than in your head. This was the start of my writing career. I also learned another difference I had at this time. I desperately wanted to be that child in the classroom who was good and said magnificent answers when the teacher called upon my name. I wanted to be that child who knew they were smart, the teacher's pet. I wasn't that kid. I was the one staring out the window, lost in a world rich of wonder and story and imagination. I was the child that shuddered with shyness when the teacher spoke my name. I literally could not answer a question in class without shaking. <laughs> I was also this child who got in trouble for doing my homework hanging upside down on the monkey bars with my notebook resting on the sand. This seemed like a perfectly natural way for me to learn. My learning differences were not understood. My, my creative grit got me through graduating at McGill, but it wasn't until I was 28 years old and I dug deep into this world, understanding diversity, beyond culture, race, but into the differences in how we think, learn, and communicate that cause these massive problems in being able to think with others. I understood that it's not how smart you are, it's how you are smart. And if you understand that, you can say, I could finally say these three words, I am smart. Independently, they don't mean much, but collaboratively, they mean the world in here. Because they are a declaration that your differences are an integral part of who you are and of what you are supposed to contribute to the world. They are a declaration that your thinking matters that your thinking matters, and your thinking matters. And these words do not come easily to most of us. Most children, a lot of people walk around thinking, I'm not smart enough. These are earned words, and everyone should be able to say them. I am smart begins with an awareness of our own thinking habits. And being able to think with those who think differently begins with this awareness of what habits we have that are limiting us. The work of the great physicist Moshe Feldenkrais helped me understand this on a cellular level. I'd like to invite you to do an experiment with me, a laboratory using your own two hands. Our hands are what distinguishes us from any other species. They work independently and collaboratively at the same time. I'd like to ask that you fold your hands in a comfortable way as if you were being a good student and paying attention. Notice, is your right thumb on top or your left? Unfold your hands. Consider one hand yourself, your other hand, a person you would like to think with. Refold your hands in the opposite way. So if your left thumb was on top before, now put your right. This is non-habitual. I'd like you to go back and forth between habitual to non-habitual while I ask you a couple of questions. 
Which way feels more comfortable? Habitual. Which way feels more awkward? Which way do your hands feel more numb to you? Which way do you feel the skin on your hands, the spaces between your fingers, and a sense of aliveness in your hands? Non-habitual. Return now to habitual way of folding your hands. This is thinking with people who think just like you do. It's comfort without challenge. Most breakdowns occur when we think with people who think just like we do. Unfold your hands and refold them in the opposite non-habitual way. This is thinking with people who think differently than you do. It's awkward, but it's alive. And this is how most thinking breakthroughs happen. When I learned this, I felt like all of a sudden my whole childhood made sense. The more awkward, the more in wonder, the more sense of aliveness we have. However, we don't know how to be awkward with each other. I'd like to introduce you to one of the great influences on my life and my partner in non-habitual thinking. She's also my co-author and thinking partner, Dr. Donna Markova. It was through diving deep into her work on perception and learning that I was finally able to say those three words, I am smart. And it also opened my eyes to how so many breakdowns can become breakthroughs in thinking with one another. This is a treat, and this is the, this is the research. It begins with attention. Attention literally means how we attend to things in the world, the people we encounter, and the world around us. What most of us don't know is that attention, I'm going to use this great prop, has different states. And for those of you who are into neuroscience, attention can be very focused. This is when your mind is producing beta waves. You're looking at what's right in front of you. You're very focused. You're able to produce um, a lot of attention. Attention can also be mediating or sorting. This is where your mind is trying to digest what someone is saying. You're sort of externally listening, but internally connecting it with your own thoughts at the same time. This is also where confusion is, and it goes back and forth. In neuroscience, this would be alpha waves. Attention can also be like this, wide open, in a state of wonder, imagination, insight. This is where you had that magnificent idea just pop into your mind when you were in the shower to a challenge that you'd been trying to solve for a long time. This is where new thoughts are born. This is aha. And we move through these different states very quickly. The big insight that I had was that we do not value all three states of attention. We're rewarded for focused attention, we consider this productive, we consider this working hard. What we don't do is allow ourselves to go into confusion and even into this state very often. When I am confused, I panic. A lot of people panic. If, you, if someone else is confused, we jump in to help them as if confusion is a pathology. If someone is in a state of wonder, we, have, we associate it negatively as spacing out, lost in thought, checked out. We consider it not working. However, unless we are willing to spend more time with ourselves and with one another in these states of awkwardness and confusion 
and open attention, we will not have the kind of innovative thinking we so desperately need. The next insight I had in working with this material with Donna is that we are triggered into these different states of attention through different input, hands-on or kinesthetic, auditory or visual. When I first met her and she hooked me up to the biomonitor equipment, which allows someone to read your brain waves, and I had something in my hand and I was able to walk around the room, my mind was producing a lot of this kind of attention. I was extremely focused. However, when she went on for a long time in story or taught too long, my mind started doing this, just as it had when I was a child listening in a classroom. For someone else, it would be different. You'd give them something to look at, a lot of visual details, and their mind would be in a very focused state of attention. You give another person someone, some, a lot of things to look at, and they may look a little bit spaced out and be triggered into that wide, open state of attention. For another person, talking or being very auditorily present, very quick with their words, their mind is very focused. And yet, you give another person a chance to talk, and they may sound wishy-washy even. On one hand, we could do this, but on the other hand, we could do that. Their mind is producing alpha waves. Talking is actually helping them sort it out. What happens is without understanding this, is we misread people all the time, and therefore we discount them. Or worse, we think of them as not smart. Donna and I saw this all over the world with leadership teams. When we asked those that we worked with in Mumbai, The Hague, London, what makes it hard for you to think with another person? They would say things like, oh, they seem spaced out, oh, they talk too much, they sound wishy-washy, they're always criticizing what I say, they seem verbally controlling. What they didn't realize is these are how attention differences show up real time. And these differences are then seen as someone being difficult. However, by understanding that we each may need something different to focus, to work through confusion, or to have a big aha and generate an idea, then those differences can be dignified. And we can actually leverage one another's thinking as opposed to discounting it. Here are some of the insights that these leaders had. Someone who didn't speak up, you normally would think, oh, they just have no opinion, transformed to, oh, auditory triggers them into an open state of attention, and it may take them a little longer to find their words. Someone they previously thought of that sounds wishy-washy, they may have said, oh, that behavior makes them indecisive, instead transforms to, oh, by listening to them, it actually, allowing them to talk it out, actually helps them come to a decision. And that to have aha moments, we each may need to have something different. For me, I need to have silence or listen to instrumental music. My partner, Donna, needs to go on a long, slow walk. My other partner, Andy, needs to see the big picture and then have time to stare out the window. These are very awkward ways to think with one another, but they're critical for us to generate the kind of innovative thinking we need. What this all boils down to is if we can give attention to what shifts our own attention, 
from a focus to a sorting to an open state, we can do it more intentionally. And if we notice what shifts another person's attention, we can suggest, let's go for a walk instead of just sitting and talking. Maybe we'll be more productive or have better ideas. We can help one another. We can increase our capacity to think. These are non-habitual ways of interacting with one another. And to think with one another is a constant riddle and practice. It's not neat. But if we can remember these two questions, how can we create the conditions where thinking differences are not disrespected but dignified And how can we be intelligent individuals and be intelligent collaborators at the same time? You will be practicing the art form I call collaborative intelligence. And the good news is, you already know how to do this. If I can remember to let go of the habits that are keeping me numb, keeping me limited, Be awkward and confused and in that space with another person where the thinking is not neat and say things like, I don't know yet, I don't understand, or you still seem confused, can we spend a little longer here? If we can do that, then eventually we can get to these wider, more innovative ahas. When we think with one another in this way, we show respect. Respect comes from the Latin respect, as if to see someone again for the first time. The more you know someone, the longer you've been working with them, the longer you've been married to them, the longer <laughs> they've been your child or your parent, the harder it is to look at someone with fresh eyes. But when you think with someone in this way, it is the intelligence in me bowing to the intelligence in you and creating what Donna and I call the possibilist. The possibilist are those who can think with those who think differently. They embody what now. Imagine a world where every child and every adult knows that their differences matter and that intelligence is measured by their ability to use those differences on behalf of what matters to us all. That is how we will evoke the leaders of today and cultivate our leaders of tomorrow. Thank you, Traverse City.